get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs like the founders of Atari, P90X, Einstein Bagels, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This is part of the IRCE e-commerce mastery series where top experts talk about what works to boost your e-commerce business. The Internet Retailer Conference and Exhibition, better known as IRCE, helps you stay ahead of your competition by bringing in some of the top e-commerce experts and companies from around the globe. Adestra will be there. We're going to talk about Adestra today. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. Rise25 hosts in-person VIP events and masterminds to help conferences and software companies serve their highest level customers. We do them all over the country, including many in the e-commerce space. Uh, We did them in Austin, Chicago, Santa Barbara, San Diego, New York, Sonoma, Las Vegas, just to name a few. So if your company sees the value of bringing your highest level customers together to connect and collaborate to get their business to the next level, go to rise25.com, contact us, and we can talk more. So thank you so much. I am very excited today. We have Steve Denner, the co-founder and COO of Adestra. Adestra is an email and marketing automation platform that helps companies take people through a customer journey to give them exactly what they want. Um, They make the distinction that it is a software and a service, and I see why because all of the customer videos about Adestra talk about their high-touch approach with their dedicated account managers, and I think one even said, Steve, that the president of the company dropped by just to make sure things were running smoothly. So, Steve, thanks for joining me. Uh, Pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, and um, I want to talk about I mean, back what the landscape was like. You co-founded Destra in 2004, and yeah. I read you saw a clear gap in the market. I wonder what did the market look like at that time in 2004. In internet years, that's like 104 years. Yeah, ago. I was going to say it makes me sound. I feel old thinking about it. Um, <laughs> the landscape was, for us, bizarrely similar to what it is now. So the text changed um, a lot in that time. The uh, the the ability of of all of the different uh, platforms in the marketplace has obviously come on leaps and bounds. The sophistication of clients' needs has changed, but really, um, it's 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 very similar now to as it was then. There's 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 more tech available than uh, the people wanting to send email can get their hands around can actually make use of. Um, uh, saying that, that, there were more companies. Uh, there's been a lot of consolidation since. Um, there are more companies so, than in the beginning. Well, if you think about some of the the big players around that time, uh, like Exact Target, um, have been acquired since then. That's Salesforce Marketing Cloud these days. Um, another one um, that would be top of most of mind um, would be Silverpot, which is now part of IBM, um, and Responsys, which is now part of Oracle. So the 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 big players then are no longer what they were, but they're, they're still the big players now um, mm. in many ways. Um, they've just got a different, um, a different badge and different capabilities. What was the gap that you saw then? The gap was very much that those provide... There's sort of a couple of ways to come at this. The gap was the, the level of service that those providers were giving. Um, and... Um, we felt, especially over here in 2004 in, in the UK, that um, we were was, we were seeing when we were talking to prospects that um, what they weren't getting was much in the way of handholding, mm. of account management, of of fast help. Um, even back then, there was a, a, a you know a, a, a big disjoint between the clients, uh, one of our clients' abilities to. To start from scratch with email and get just a level of sophistication on their own with just you know a login and off you go. Um, and what they were finding from the big players in, in, in 2004, who were at that time mostly American businesses who had small European presences, um, was that they didn't get that help. 
um, or it was hard or it wasn't fast enough. You know, you, you, what you found in 2004 that there weren't many people who had 100% of their time dedicated to email marketing. They were general marketers who had, you know, a couple of hours in their diary to get the email campaign out. And if it didn't do what it needed to do, then their email was late and they were, might get fired. <laughs> it's high pressure. Um, and so having someone at the end of the phone or at the end of an online chat to just go, hey, hey, it's all right, we'll help you get that campaign out. Um, you need to press this button, yeah. it will help you fix your HTML. Push the easy that button. Was huge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, Where did the initial that, idea come it, from? Say again, sorry. Where did the initial idea come from? Why email? Well, I wish uh, myself and Henry, the, my co-founder and, and, and colleagues, Dan and Carl, who are also founders, it, I wish we'd, we could take credit for, for seeing it um, ourselves purely out of our own inspiration. But actually, the four of us worked together in a, in a business at the tail end of the dot-com era in 2000. And that business, the the managing director of that business, uh, and I have I don't know why, um, decided to change the direction of his business, which was a print firm, to being an email service provider. Mm. Um, so that didn't work. That it, it lot for lots of different reasons. But the, the four of us plus some others in that business thought, well, the principles right. There's people wanting to do this, and you could see that there was a requirement. We were all internet users. We were all receivers of email and um you know thought that there was a good business idea there because so it was we, a direct it started off as a direct mail company right yes absolutely it was yeah. yeah we're doing um print runs for people like dell and doing data processing for other companies you know it was a it was a bit of a change um but you know it, it made sense actually and if you think what happened over the the following years um, direct mail was replaced by email to a large degree, um, so it, 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 I could see why it made sense to, to, to do that in 2000. Um, and we just ran with the idea then. Um, we weren't it, we weren't the masters of our own destiny between 2000 and 2004. Um, we were a part of a, a, a larger organisation, um, and we want in, in 2004 we wanted to do it ourselves essentially. Um, get control um, of of the operation that we had at that time just in Oxford. Um, uh, so in 2004, it was really a case of, right, well, we think we know we can do this, so let's do this. So talk about that decision, right? Because now do you just quit full-time and go full-time on this? What's the what's that transition look like? Because, I mean, there is you know a steady paycheck. There is other things to then starting a, you know, at the time, a startup. Yes, and it's funny, you look back and you, th you it feels more risky in hindsight than it did at the time. Um, but it, we, we were in an organization at the time where the, the group of us, and there were about eight of, eight of us, I think, or so, working in, this, in the Oxford office, um, we were generating 80% of the revenue for that, the business we were working for, but only taking up 20, 30% of the cost. So we could see that all we saw really was, well, that should be fine then. We can do you it. You could do it again. You could just pick up and then generate exactly. more business for yourselves type of thing. Correct. And we, we, we should be able to make it enough business to cover the costs we have here. Um, so you, I didn't see it as a bigger risk then as I would potentially see it as now. That's for sure. Well, I guess maybe part of it is because you had a team of people to start with. Yes, absolutely. Yes, right. there was, and we had good a good spread of skills um, in, in and amongst the founders there. And um, you know, we, we joke about it that Henry would uh, would go out and sell stuff. Um, Dan and Carl would actually then have to write it, and I would support it. You know, that that's and, and that's it, it's a uh, it's a, it's an exaggeration for comic effect, but it's reasonably true as well that we did have a core of people that could cover the bases to, to support clients what was and the right most back. yeah what was the most challenging part of that initial stage um because like you said there's a lot of moving parts right you have you have to get the customer right then you have to have a platform that works and you have to have the customer service then you have to have all of those components in there what was what was the most challenging then compared to now i would, 
I'd, I, I would, typical to me, I would wouldn't be able to bring it down to one, but I could give you two. Go ahead. Well, yeah. The first one would have been was convincing the the larger clients um, that we were a viable alternative, even though we were a new company. Um, and that took some doing. Uh, we were relatively lucky in that when we when we became a Destra, um, some clients that we had been servicing for for a few years came over with us. So we we were able to have reference points and, and and things. But you know that that only goes so far. So that was hard. A challenge to sort of go because we were that 2004 date we thought wasn't reflective of our experience and what the capabilities of our platform were. Right. But it was a start date on a business that was, oh, so you're only a year old or you're only, you know, X months old. That feels like a risk for me to, to, to sign with you. And on the other side, because we had to restart and rewrite, you know, we weren't taking a platform and running it. We had to write our own from yeah. the, the genesis of Adestra. It was catching up, you know, was, was, was getting feature parity in some way, shape or form. Um, that so those two races were happening at the same time. You know, trying to convince people we were mature enough and 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 expand the platform's functionality. Yeah, and we were talking, Steve, before um, that marketers mainly use this platform. So yeah. I want to talk a little about about the evolution of the features because they're okay. probably yeah. driven by the customers, I imagine. So they are. early on, what were some of the most popular features, and then what have they evolved to? today that's a good question because it it, it it tells a little bit of a, a, a hint into our story as a business because the initial clients we had were um, for for just out of coincidence they were relatively complex businesses they were media firms um, who had bits of they were publishing events um, online they were, who would have hundreds of brands potentially um, and hundreds of users and that drove us to write a platform in the early days of Adestra that could cope with that and that gave us an immediate USP because at that time no other platform had that it was very difficult to have one login for a CMO who could then see what everyone was doing within his or her organization and yet a marketer could log in and all they saw was what they needed to do um, and we were unique with that um, and that you know was and remains actually one of our major USPs and that was a, a just that just the ability to do that was mm. was a big convincer for a lot of businesses with where um, for whether it was because uh, a CMO might be looking to get some kind of control over their hundreds of marketers around the, the, the world trying different things um, or it might be because um, the requirements were wholly different. So you might have a firm, one of you know, a client of ours might have a team over in New York doing things entirely differently and needing their software to behave entirely differently to the team in London. Um, and yet, they still wanted it all under one roof and under one, under control. Yeah. So that we, the fact that we had that in the early days was was wildly yeah. important. Yeah, it's something that if someone was wasn't serving that type of business, they would have no idea that's even a pain point or a need. I guess correct. Say. Yes. Yeah. And it, it makes a big difference to how you then build the platform from then on. So we were lucky in that regard because it's enabled us to to build on that. And yeah, it's hard to reverse if you have one yeah. login and then you're like, oh wait, I need to create this overarching login yeah. where you can see get your viewpoint into different accounts. Absolutely. And when yeah. it comes to data compliance and um, how you might set up and look after your data let alone user permissions and things like that, it's almost impossible to retrofit mm. um, without doing loads and loads of sort of custom work and, and bits of random scripts and things that have to be then be maintained and nasty stuff, horrible. <laughs> um, but we were lucky we didn't have that and that, well, that became a, that was a USP. Now as time went on with the, the, the platform, the way we've developed the platform has been typical to any business and for the first 10 years we were bootstrap business as well so it really was a case of what do the clients need primarily and then also what cutting out 90 percent of what they're saying and only how do you manage that input of what they're saying they need because obviously you can't execute on all of that how do you decide what to implement next it's um how we've done it has changed over the years the principles remain the same though Mm -hmm. 
which is that you you have to we try and pick the ones that will have the biggest impact for the most number of clients um, and also not write features that are restricted to a particular type of client so we're we're lucky enough to have a wide spread of businesses um, from sort of um, a pure e-commerce single brand right the way through to international multi-brand b2b businesses that but it is possible with a bit of thought to write a feature for that may have come in from an e-commerce clients requirements in a way that then makes sense to everyone else so that's always the approach we try and write everything that we that, that comes up in a way that makes sense to all of our user base because then you can in, everyone gets benefit um, and I think that the other thing is to be really strong on not writing custom code for clients because that enables you to continuously iterate and improve the platform so um, you with every for every one major new feature we might release there's always 20 or 30 enhancements to existing functionality that go in and that's how your platform grows becomes more feature rich and actually starts to wrap itself around your client base you know to their needs um, and it how do we do it it's a combination of listening very closely to what our support and account management teams say yeah. um, also taking in um, information from the the sales teams because they have they, they're the ones that will first see a need our I'm just. I'm asking this, and I'm wondering how they log it. Like even more granular, because oh, okay. any customer, any business who's listening to this should be using some process to implement. What it doesn't matter if it's a software business, an e-commerce business. Like, how do you take? Okay, you get the salesperson's noticing it. Where do they put it? And then the customer service. Do, do they put it like on some Asana board somewhere? Where then it get? You know, what does that look like? Because I know you guys are all about service and so i know you're talking you're actually talking to your customers probably pretty frequently so i'm wondering how do they log that along for your customer's journey to then implement so we we have if it's a if it's a i can go i can go as granular as you like yeah if it's a uh if it's a support request so if our support team are hearing about something yeah um they're the first they're the best people to understand exactly what the platform's capable of so if they go it's not capable of that there, uh, where they log it, and we use uh, Jira as a, a tool, mm. where they log it gets fast-tracked into uh, a weekly triage meeting. Where mm. it, And before it gets there, if they think it might be a bug, it's gone through our QA team to try and replicate it. So mm. a constant stream of, of bug, what could be bugs slash um, client thinks that it would be better if it worked this way are, be, are being run into that. And those... Tickets are then either added to an existing larger project because mm. they're in an area of the functionality that we're going to be looking at anyway, yeah. or get picked up as loose tickets in the next sprint. Um, with the wider business, account managers, sales, uh, and our professional services teams, who are also, as you say, yeah. talking to clients and prospects yeah. all the time. Yeah. First of they, all, this is this is fascinating, Steve. So anyone who you know runs a bit, if you don't, if this is boring you, then no, don't no, worry about is, it. For uh, for people listening, but it's really fascinating to see this, you know, the Jira, then it goes either bug versus new feature, and then that takes a separate pathway. Yes. Right, yeah. And it, then there's a blend. for If it's, if it's a, 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 a small amount of work for, to implement, and we think it will be beneficial to all of our clients, but it not really it wouldn't form part of a bigger project, then it goes in as a, 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 a loose ticket that then our developers, if they're at a certain point in a sprint and they've got a window of time that works, they can pick it up and do it. Um, similarly, if it is part, part of a piece of, a large piece of work or would make sense to be done at the time, you know, at the same time as a large piece of work that's been planned in the roadmap, then it just gets added to that mm. and gets actioned out through that route. Um, the We then have a slightly different process for the rest of the business as opposed to support because it's less likely to be a bug so it's less likely that we're required to act on it straight away right away right um and that's um so same systems jira but the different access for the users and they log it as an idea and that enables our product management team to ask more questions 
and sort of in a in a format of why does the client want it? What benefit will they have from it? Those sorts of you know a list of a dozen questions, um, which then again hits that that weekly triage meeting, um, and then the stakeholders who might actually in the product management team, but also from the development teams, they can ratify that what that whether there's enough information there to turn it into a series of tickets, or whether that then needs to go back. So we can get the product management team can engage with the account manager and the client to find out, right, well, we didn't quite understand what you wanted there and fill out. And then at the end of that, we end up with a series of a series of or one ticket in the system for the dev team to work on. Yeah. Then. Yeah, go on. The next step is that you then, of course, have got a huge list of, of potential things you can write. And as you say, you can't write it all. Um, wish we could. Um, and we have a cycle at the moment whereby we are, we take the it's around about the 30 or 40 um, most likely projects so and that could be a feature or it could be an enhancement but we you know we, we they're called epics in Jira but we think of them as a project um, and we allow the business to vote on them mm. so everyone in the business is allowed to say I think that one would be more important to me than this one That's cool. score it um, and that then gives us a prioritized list that we can put in front of steering. And a steering committee can then judge what with their, and these tend to be the more senior people within the business, can say and add, add the strategic layer, you know, because we might have a sea of clients and a sea of account managers saying mm. we want this to be written, but we've got a sea of prospects that want something else to be written. So that balancing act happens in steering. And then what steering decides is ratified by the board in case the board strategy is any different, which it mm. usually is, but right. you know, just in case. And then you've got buy-in all the way down the chain for the roadmap. Yeah, but our roadmap is only ever really nailed down for the foreseeable four, five, maybe six months. Beyond that, obviously, it changes as the priority changes and the voting changes and so on. I love this. Yeah, I mean, there's. I would love to see. That I mean, when a customer, I don't know if customers even real, they probably don't, you know, realize when they're making something that it's following these, you know, seventy-seven steps until you, you know, you're really methodically um, thinking about this all along yes. the way. So that'd be cool to and tell them. Pace this, you know. to this, right? So uh, we have a, a good, speedy. De- you know, we deploy new code every two weeks mm-hmm. at the minimum. And we have two week sprint cycles. So our ability to you know, that agile ability, capital A, is really powerful. The whole process I've outlined and all of the various um, things that go around it, the admin and so on that goes around it, does mean that you can end up with a ticket that takes more time to for the process than actually for a developer to code. Oh of course, yeah. But that's that's a side effect. Um, and the, the only negative side effect, because the rest, actually, what you end up with is a, a much more efficient process of prioritizing the work yeah. uh, and a better way of planning the roadmap. Totally, that's awesome. Um, so, talk about one of those that came in from a customer, and then we'll that gets spit out the other side. That was a key um, feature because of what you were listening to the customer. What what's What's one lately that people are loving that came because a customer or a company had suggested? Uh, I can give you many. Yeah. Um, so s- stop me when I get too boring. Yeah, go ahead. Um, the most recent two, um, I'll go with the most, re- the I'll most tell recent. You, I'll tell you my favorite, six. by the way. Second, sorry? I'll tell you my favorite from my research. But, but I'll, okay. go, I'll let you go first. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, we we wrote um, we rewrote our editing tool, our email editor, as a result of feedback, and actually it came from everywhere. Um, we had we did have in place already several different ways of editing and creating HTML to send your email. Probably three that were being supported at the time, different ways of doing it, three different tools. Um, uh, and yet, um, a sales team was saying it's not quite as good as these guys we see and we compete against. They oh. have something that looks more shiny in a demo. It looked better to demo. So it wasn't necessarily about functionality, although there's an element of that. It, it came across. Mm. Our thing came across. Like as more the fun. UI looked better. 
Yeah, the UI and and some of the the the, uh, the, the perception when you first saw it and first used it mm. was 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 better for some of our competitors that we were competing against at the time. Um, and similarly, we had requirements from clients. We were seeing that our support teams, that the, the largest number of requests, and I think this will never go away entirely, but for a business like us, the biggest volume of requests we got were for people, can you help me fix my HTML? Can you help me do this? So marketers who aren't HTML coders by, you know, totally. they don't have the time to learn that either. We're getting so far with it, but needing us to help them finish it off. Um, so we had, so, you know, our support team saying we need to look at that functionality, and we had the sales team saying the it's, same thing. We're not able to demo something that's as slick, um, and so we um, that pushed up to the top of the list an email editor project, um, and that was um, it was actually slightly before the time that we went to two week sprints. Um, and, but slightly after the time we moved to a more agile, less waterfall way of work um, and, and product management were very, very mm -hmm. much involved in the release of that and it's had a huge impact. The number of support mm -hmm. cases is going down even whilst the number of users is going up um, and we get incredible feedback from people that um, are up and running with it um, and it's slick to demo. It's been an amazing transformative be bit of tech and the adoption of that feature. Yeah. Is huge. I mean, I think something like seventy percent of our clients are already on it, and it's only been around a year or so, and mm. that's unheard of for yeah. something like. That. So, Steve, I want to talk about the next feature, but I I want to highlight something that is is you're talking about subtly, which is agile and waterfall. Because one thing that changed transformed the way I did things was learning Scrum methodology and Scrum. Yes. Okay, it completely transformed how I do things on a daily basis. So when you're mentioning those things, if anyone's listening and they're, they're not sure or picking up on that, you know, where did you learn? Is there a resource or was this ingrained in the previous company of using the agile scrum methodology for people who don't know what it is and they should be, I know that, um, there's a book, uh, scrum, um, and people get certified on, Scrum and all that, but um, I don't know if there was a resource that you loved that you learned from. It was um, "It's the Art of Doing Twice the Work in Half the Time" by Jeff Sutherland. That was one of the books that I had uh, come across. I don't know. Yes. What about you? That, it wasn't that one. So, for I tell you where my what the resource, as is typical for any any business, I think um, the best way of dealing with it from a, a resource to find out how to do it properly is 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 hire the right people. Mm. Um, and the requirement for us to change came around relatively organically. We didn't, we didn't hit a wall. We didn't have a situation whereby um, things were going wrong and therefore we needed to switch to, to a scrum methodology. Um, however, it wouldn't have made sense when we were smaller and we had a smaller number of developers and we didn't have um, a significant amount of product management resource. Yeah. You know, that kind of support that that methodology requires for a team of developers is, is you know, we, we had yeah. developers and no product management was, wasn't a function in the business that was distinct at that time. So it came from a few different angles. Uh, um, technical director was thinking it might be the way to go he you know we were getting to a certain size in terms of, of the amount of of, um, of people we had doing development that made started to make sense to do it um, to work in teams and so forth we hired some very capable people into product management and into leadership positions in development therefore we can now do it you know yeah. it, it was something where it was all broken and we fixed it right um, but we, it was a more of an evolution, actually. Yeah. Um, but again, hindsight is is twenty twenty, isn't it? And I, I yeah. definitely think that we did it at exactly the right time. Yeah. Um, I, mean, I just wanted to sidetrack yeah. there for a second because I think it's so important to highlight that, right? Because this mm. is how the, the underlying 
it, it's run all, like even from when someone comes in and submits some kind of ticket so i just wanted to talk about that but back to the features so html what was another popular feature that popped up that people love people have really got on board with and that's just a smaller number than than the editing at the moment although that is changing over time but we wrote um an automation um suite um, and it's it was a crucial thing for us to do we were seeing especially around the time of uh, some of the consolidation that was happening that um we were losing some clients to what were the, at the time and it's slightly different these days were called marketing automation platforms that were the, at the, that time distinct from um, just email, email marketing like, totally yeah. yes yeah yeah um, and that convergence was starting but and we we saw an opportunity to uh, to expand our functionality in that area and to make that kind of capability easy for marketers to use because what we were also seeing was that at the enterprise end, which is where you know we we tend to sit, the those vendors were putting together um, some really great automation tools, but they weren't really great for marketers. They were great for marketing technologists, yeah. which meant that our clients, you know, we had users who were being told by their bosses, "You need to be doing this." Um, but weren't necessarily able to enact it. And so we thought if we can write this tool into our platform, um, and so it's in the same place where you can do the same sort of campaigns as you've always been doing, maybe the batch and blast, more broadcast oriented um, sending, but at the same time start the process of moving to more automation, but you're not having to learn anything new. You're not having to go out to a different platform. You're not gonna have to do any data transformation or any kind of integration to make that work. That would be valuable. Um, and it, that was that was the the big project prior to the email editor that mm. we released, and we've built on that since. That's a constant yeah. evolution, and it, it's it's been really important for us. And I think the fact that it is in one place, uh, and it it is it isn't a different tool, it's seen as just part of the whole. Yeah. It's has been a huge win for us, um, and gives a, a lot of our future functionality is going to be hanging off that more automation style you know um journey building yeah i mean i was able to i watched a video actually this morning on someone i think it was just one of your users walking through the automation and you know basically okay you know here's this this list or whatever going to with an arrow and then kind of actually mapping it out within industry yeah. so it's kind of a cool uh some you know and that helps people customize the journey for the uh, for the user, essentially, absolutely. Um, and it, 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 it's a uh, it, it, it's it. If you go to uh, an, an event, uh, you often see, and we do it ourselves, and we've you probably saw it on on the video, um, that you can go to the nth degree with these automations, and you can see these incredible maps of the, the of our clients creating a customer journey for their for their customers which take you know mm. all manner of different complexities and i think actually when you see that as a marketer that can be quite intimidating and you think to yourself well how, how am i going to create all those <laughs> segments how am i going to that that then means rather than one or two pieces of, of html copy i need to put together and, and landing pages i need to have to 30 or 40 and then that you just think well i'm never going to be able to do that I think it's a job of vendors like us to make the tools easy so that right. you can start small and work your way into that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, it, uh, you can do some really, really cool stuff from small beginnings. And Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. you don't have to start there, right? You just add, yeah. on, add on to it. I would love to see, I don't know, I haven't checked out the latest blog, but love to see a snap picture of some of those customers and what they, you know, just a snap pick of, of one of the customer journeys that they oh, have. That would be really cool. Because yeah. um, then I do want to talk about some of the customers and what they're doing with the platform. Um, Incisive Media, Cheesecake yes. Factory, I know Blinds to Go are a customer. But um, before I go to, I want you to talk about Incisive Media. But before, I want to talk about my, what I think is the coolest. I don't know if this is um, the most popular, but I when I saw the heat map, the heat oh, mapping, yeah. um, 
how are people using heat mapping? Talk a little bit about, describe it a little bit for people. It's, um, so for those that haven't seen it, it's a tool that um, takes the, the email that you've sent um, and uh, overlays what people have clicked on. Um, so that the, and, and in, in a, as the name implies, excuse me, it's like an infrared heat map so that the hottest places that you see, the brightest colors are where people have clicked the most. And so therefore you can see from vi visually really easily where the, um, where your end users, your email recipients have been clicking on the email and people use that. Actually, it's, it's one of the most, it's one of the most fascinating areas of, of, when you're in the nitty gritty of analyzing what's working and what not, what's totally. not working, because you see some re very different results depending on the client's uh, user base. There's no hard and fast rule. Yeah. You might hear someone might say, what "Well, there's always going to be a call to action here." Well, actually, you might find that that works for that client, their the people that they have on their lists, but it doesn't work for a, for a different user base. And you might uh, an, an example. I often give is that um, in a more newsletter style um, layout of email where you have sort of picture of a, a product or a picture of so any kind of picture and then a block of text with a read more click. That's fairly common in lots of emails, whether it's e-commerce, whether it's a, a, a news website, whatever. When you look on the heat map, for some, for some clients, it's always the image that's clicked on. And for others, it's never the image that's clicked on. <laughs> and you, that, but that kind of insight, you can only, you know, it, it's really useful. You've got for to a, test it. Yeah, you've got to test it. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the fact that you can, with our tool, um, show the heat map results based on the, the variant that you've picked for your split test can be quite powerful. So what else have you seen, if you remember any data that surprised you from the heat mapping? Like what people clicked or didn't click that almost seems counterintuitive like you said like if you or if there's hard and fast rules like always include a picture with a link underneath are there any hard and fast rules um that people may be missing out a lot of low-hanging fruit when they're sending lots of emails well the the, the rule is there are no rules um and the, the answer to that question is always it depends right um, totally but but I, the advice I always would give it, it is not only test, 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 but your start point should always be to give the most opportunity for someone to click through to the call to action. You know, minimalist approaches whereby you might only have, you know, surely there are, the, the eye is drawn to this great graphic I have down here in the bottom right. No. You make some assumptions early doors that you, you must have a call to action somewhere high in the email because, you know, with us all using devices and it, it all those principles apply but yeah. test is test I don't think there is any there's no distinctive pattern that he says this always works or right. this always doesn't work um, but there's always there's always something thrown up that you wouldn't expect from testing yeah um, I've seen the, the 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 links buried down after three or four scrolls um, being the highest click really you know, and and that can be from factors that you don't expect. Um, I remember, if, you know, it, you, you can't control what's happening elsewhere. So if you see so you're a news um, provider and you're, just, it might well be that what you thought was the fifteenth most important story, by the time your email's gone out, is the most important story. Mm. You know, it, there's things you can't predict. And similarly with products, you know, if you're selling, if it's an e-commerce, what your e-commerce platforms told you is the most popular product yesterday isn't necessarily what it, mm. it would be today so there's all it's constantly testing has to be the is the answer yeah it's so you can get so granular with this from the subject line to the mm. body to the you know ps to where you put the links where you put the images yeah. um talk about incisive media for a second so, so they left we, and came back that's right. Yeah. Although they never quite left. Uh, it was an interesting one. And it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's almost a badge of honor for us here at Adestra, the relationship we've had with um, a business like that. And that it was around the time of the um, uh, this consolidation starting. So um, I'm not sure 
what stage all of those different consolidations were in terms of acquire, you know, people being acquired, but that was happening. So there was a lot of noise being made by our larger competitors, it's huge marketing spend and so forth. And um, uh, it was deemed, and you know, I, I'm not. There's no. Um, I wouldn't contradict the decision. Actually, it was deemed that we were too small and that we wouldn't be able to provide what was required moving forward. Actually, what we found um, was that in the attempt to move to a, one of the larger sort of st all-encompassing stack providers um, took a lot longer. It, you know, it was, it took over two years anyway to get to the point where they might have been able to leave us. Um, and... Um, the our ability to support um, was as important as the tech, um, and that was proved through the, 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 their attempt to move to one of the largest stack providers, and that not going well. All the way through that, we continued to help them get things out the door. So I relate, you know, the relationship plus the the fact that the tech was, you know, we were our own worst enemy, and certainly those days, sort of five or six years ago, at not telling the world how great we were with our tech. Um, mm. So the perception across the client, totally. client that was different to the reality, and then yeah. when the reality hit home, actually we can't replicate that. What we're doing with Destra, with this other provider, without spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on professional services, you, you know that's that 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 was a that's a story that um, I like telling because it it's still true now, um, even a few a few years later that. Uh, we are able to wrap ourselves around enterprise clients um, in a way that's um, well we think is, is unique to us. Who's a good fit for Adestra? Because I know you mentioned a couple enterprise. Um, like, where should people be at minimum to consider Adestra as their solution? If you, it's good. We we sit in a in a in an interesting place. Um, we have we we gain clients who from two sources really and that's those that are using um, providers that are not necessarily enterprise level uh, uh, you know turnkey providers that were great to get you going as a small business but then you reach a certain point where that the functionality in in that that tech is a glass ceiling potentially so we gain clients who are on that ladder on the way up in terms of requirements um, but we also have a, um, a lot of success with those with with clients and it doesn't matter what vertical it really doesn't these days there was a time when you've asked me that I would have said oh well, we're more b2b or there's an, this, a period of time where we concentrated on on um, catching up with our retail specific functionality so these days vertical wise isn't necessarily an issue the commonality though for a lot of people joining us at the moment is that they are with one of the big four, five providers, um, but aren't getting help to use the tech. And getting they've 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 got they're buying from a business that can do all the hundreds of different things that they need it to do, but they never get anywhere with it. So they come to us as oh, okay, well let's start again. Point solution, best best in breed email provider who can give us the functionality we need and help us do it yeah and i know we have a few minutes um i have i have uh one last question and we didn't i mean i have all these questions written like there's so many more challenges with this type of thing like deliverability right i mean there's there's so many things that go into what you have to do so it's it's wild but we don't have enough time to get into all that but before I ask the question, I think everyone should check out adestra.com, A-D-E-S-T-R-A.com. They have some great videos also from, you guys had your own um, email summit, right? That's right. Do you yep. do that every yeah. year or? Yes, we've done it every year cool. uh, in um, in our EMEA operation. And we had our first uh, North American summit hmm. um, this year as well. Where was it? Um, and that will re that will repeat um we have no concrete plans as yet but there's talk of um the north american summits being repeated in different locations cool yeah you know, that east coast west coast 
Um, and I think we will also have a summit in, in Australia as well, probably in Sydney. Just because you're uh, on a vacation there. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank Wherever you're, you're vacationing that year is where the summit should be. Yeah. Yeah. Shh. Um, um, so so they're, they're really useful events. So, yeah, I watched several of the, the videos. I'm going to check them out, but go to adestra.com. So last question, Steve. You know, you guys did focus and you found this. It's a unique selling proposition that you don't just have a software, you have a service. And I think behind any service, someone has a method for customer support. But beyond, even before that, precedes that is what do you do to attract great talent? Because it's really the talent that you guys attract that is serving the customer. A hundred percent. And the, uh, the only way to, in my opinion, the only way to grow a business is to hire people that are better at it than you. Um, and grow teams that way, grow teams by bringing in people with diverse skill sets. So we, I think, I like to think we attract talent because we are a good company to work for and that we, there's no hidden agendas in that. What do I mean by that? We want, we've always wanted to be, since we founded the business, the kind of business that we would want to buy from. So if we were in the market for an email service provider, we would pick ourselves because it's a good company to do business with. Mm -hmm. um, and if that, and that I think um, is carried through the business. So yeah. it's how departments relate to each other. It's how um, individuals relate to each other. It's how processes are designed yeah. to work. Unpack so that for a second. Cool. Yeah, unpack like, so a company that's good to work for, what do you do that makes you good to work for? What do you hear from the staff? So that other p companies, you know, be like, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. I should be doing that, too, or I should implement that also. Well, I think it's – I don't know that there's any particular secret formula. We're, we're lucky, I guess, in that we're still at a size where we can operate very much with a, still with a, that kind of startup mindset where no idea is a bad idea and that mistakes are fine. You know, we can try things, and if they don't work – fine we now know that that doesn't work um, and we're we're able again to use that word we're able to be agile as a business still um, and that means you know there's open door policies for all of the senior management people um, I, I love the fact that people can join this business and then move around departments as their as their interests change their skills change as they want to, to, to develop as an individual um, and we're all for that, um, and if you sort of add that to the the fact that we, I think that as a whole, add all that up, then the, the sum of that is that it becomes a an interesting and engaging place to work. I hope, and that you you know, although it's it's hard work, it always is, especially with a a business whereby the the the, the customer satisfaction is the most important thing. Then. You know, if a customer has a problem, you, it's hard. You know, everyone has to work hard to fix it, and there's a there's a lot to be done. But if you're doing that in an environment where you know you'll get supported, and you won't get beaten up if you make a mistake, I think that helps. For sure. Um, so, see, where should we point people? Any other places besides Adestra.com? Any other places on the website they should check out or online? I would suggest um, the, the 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 website's a great jumping off point. Um, uh, pretty much everyone at Adestra is on LinkedIn. A lot of people also on Twitter, um, and there's a lot of activity in both of those environments that um, is usually related to something that's happened on the website, but not always. So, yeah, I'd, I'd uh, I welcome anyone to, to to connect on LinkedIn or, um, or or follow us on any of the, anyone on Twitter that's an Adestrian. Cool. Well, everyone, check out adestra.com. If you see them at IRC or any other conference, go out, say hello. Definitely. And uh, see if I want to be the first one. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Oh, no, thank you, Jeremy. That's been great. Yeah. We enjoyed it. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire. Came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.